Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at respiration in the absence of oxygen, an introduction to anaerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration in mammals, anaerobic respiration in plants and fungi, and then we'll finish with a summary. So, so far in our videos we've seen how ATP is generated through respiration in the presence of oxygen in aerobic respiration. So remember the purpose of respiration is to make ATP, and at the end of the respiration we have the process of oxidative phosphorylation. And in this process we have hydrogen ions or protons going down their gradient through an enzyme called ATP synthase to produce ATP. And when oxygen is present it acts as the final electron acceptor to make water. However there are some circumstances where there isn't enough oxygen available in a given time period to carry out aerobic respiration. For example if we're carrying out vigorous exercise that our muscles might be contracting so much that actually the level of oxygen goes down. So aerobic respiration isn't able to happen, but we still need to produce energy. The reason is, when oxygen isn't present, it's not able to act as the final electron acceptor. So remember, after oxidative phosphorylation, the hydrogen ions and the electrons from the electron transport chain, they come together to reform hydrogen as hydrogen atoms, and oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So it kind of takes these electrons and hydrogens to form water. So it's the final electron acceptor, but obviously when oxygen isn't available, it's not able to do this. When there's no final electron acceptor, the proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane cannot be maintained. So remember, for this process of hydrogen ions to pass through ATP synthase and therefore make ATP in the process, there has to be a gradient from the intermembrane space to the matrix. Otherwise, it would never flow down that channel. And usually what would happen is the hydrogen ions would get mopped up by oxygen to form water. But when there's no oxygen, there's nothing to mop them up. So they go through the channel, they build up here, and they build up so much that there's actually no gradient anymore for them to go through this channel. So they stop going through and ATP doesn't get made, and therefore aerobic respiration stops happening. As well as this happening, the reduced NAD and the reduced FAD coming from other processes cannot unload their hydrogen atoms at the inner mitochondrial membrane. So in order for chemiosmosis to happen, the reduced NAD and FAD have to unload their hydrogen atoms towards the inner membrane so that eventually they get sent to the intermembrane space where they can then go down ATP synthase to make ATP. But if the hydrogen ion concentration is already high here because there's no oxygen to mop them up, then this process of unloading doesn't happen. So again, they can't donate their hydrogens, and this won't therefore feed into chemiosmosis. So because of these two reasons, the Lynx reaction, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation stop occurring. So oxidative phosphorylation stops because there's no oxygen to mop up the hydrogen ions. If the hydrogen ions aren't getting mopped up, the reduced NAD isn't losing its hydrogens to reform oxidized NAD. So the Krebs cycle stops working as well. And because the Krebs cycle isn't going around, the acetyl-CoA builds up and pyruvate doesn't make it anymore, and so the Lynx reaction stops too. So it acts as a kind of conveyor belt as oxygen mops up the final products and feeds the conveyor belt and pulls it all through. If there's no oxygen, then the whole thing stops happening and everything shuts down. So how do we get around this despite the fact that we need energy? The only respiratory pathway that can continue when there's no oxygen is glycolysis, which is the first step in respiration. And just to recap in glycolysis, we have a molecule of glucose being turned into a molecule of hexose bisphosphate. And in doing so, we've produced two ATP molecules. The hexose bisphosphate gets turned into two triose phosphate molecules. And then in the conversion of them to two molecules of pyruvate, we make four ATP molecules. And crucially, we make reduced NAD in the process. So this process is glycolysis, and basically it can keep feeding through even when oxygen is absent. So glycolysis happens whether oxygen is present or not. Remember, the purpose overall is to produce ATP. So in making ATP, glycolysis requires a free NAD to accept a hydrogen atom from triose phosphate, resulting in the formation of reduced NAD. So this is looking at the last step in glycolysis, where we have two triose phosphate molecules, and they have to be converted to two pyruvate molecules. 
This produces the useful product, which is, of course, ATP, and we make four of them. So this is great because we've now fulfilled the goal of making energy. But it also means that NAD gets reduced to reduced NAD in the process. So for this process to happen, we have to start with oxidized NAD so that it can accept a hydrogen from these guys and then go to form pyruvate. So we have to start with oxidized NAD in this step. So if we want to keep feeding glycolysis around many, many times, the reduced NAD has to be reoxidized to NAD so that it can keep going back to glycolysis, accepting a hydrogen atom again. So the reduced NAD has a hydrogen atom, and remember this was made in this step of glycolysis. But if we want glycolysis to keep going round, we have to turn it back to oxidize NAD. So to form NAD without a hydrogen, this process is reoxidized or reoxidizing. And if it's reoxidized, we formed NAD again, and it can feed back to this step in glycolysis, which means, of course, we can make ATP and more reduced NAD. So we have to reoxidize NAD for the process to carry on. So how do we reoxidize it? Well, it cannot be reoxidized at the electron transport chain as it usually would, so another pathway is needed to reoxidize NAD. So what would normally happen in aerobic respiration is the reduced NAD and FAD molecules come along to the mitochondrial membrane and they unload their hydrogens because the hydrogens are needed for that proton gradient. And then of course they would go back to glycolysis. But this isn't happening now because there's no oxygen and as we said earlier, all of these gradients have dissipated and there's no ability for them to unload the hydrogen anymore. So this isn't the way to get back to oxidized NAD. So anaerobic respiration, therefore, consists of glycolysis combined with an alternative pathway to reoxidize NAD. So here's glycolysis in a sort of overview diagram. And remember, the function of this is to make ATP. But we make this step happen again and again and again to make ATP when oxygen isn't around. So anaerobic respiration uses glycolysis. But of course, wanting this step to happen, we have to keep making oxidized NAD so that it can go back and keep feeding through. So anaerobic respiration contains glycolysis and a reoxidation pathway, which doesn't use the unloading of hydrogens at the oxidative phosphorylation stage. So these together make up anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration in mammals uses a particular pathway. Anaerobic respiration always happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. So it's not in the mitochondria this time, it's in the cytoplasm, where actually glycolysis happens as well. So they happen in the same place. In mammal cells, the lactate fermentation pathway is used to reoxidize the reduced NAD to be reused in glycolysis. So remember, we're trying to get NAD, which has been reduced in glycolysis, to go back to its original oxidized form in reoxidation. And in mammals, this pathway is the lactate fermentation pathway. This lactate fermentation process only mostly occurs in muscle tissue when the demand for ATP for muscle contraction is very high and there's an oxygen deficit. So we've basically got this decreased oxygen, so aerobic respiration isn't happening. Initially, the muscle would have been going through aerobic respiration to do its work, because that produces a lot more ATP. But of course, if there's no oxygen, this stops working, so it has to begin anaerobic respiration. And of course, in anaerobic respiration, this lactate pathway, or lactate fermentation pathway, starts happening when the demand keeps going. So how does this pathway work? In the lactate fermentation pathway, a molecule of pyruvate, which was produced at the end of glycolysis, accepts the hydrogen atoms from those reduced NAD molecules, which are also made in glycolysis. So we've got to the end of glycolysis and we've got a pyruvate molecule. In making those ATP during glycolysis, we made reduced NAD. And of course, our goal here is to reoxidize NAD back to its original form. So in doing this, what happens is the pyruvate takes the hydrogen atom off the NAD, so we've got oxidized NAD again. But in taking the hydrogen, the pyruvate becomes a molecule of lactate. So the main product we're trying to make here is this molecule, reoxidized NAD. The lactate is the product we make as a consequence of this. This particular pathway is catalyzed by the enzyme known as lactate dehydrogenase, and it results in the formation of lactate and oxidized NAD. So just to go through again, NAD with its hydrogen, the hydrogen gets accepted by pyruvate, pyruvate becomes lactate, and because NAD has lost its hydrogen, it's now oxidized NAD. So this is catalyzed by lactate 
dehydrogenase. And then of course the oxidized NAD can go back and accept more hydrogen atoms from the triose phosphate during glycolysis. So here just to show you again, we're trying to make this step continue going forward because we're trying to make ATP molecules. We need to make oxidized NAD. So the pathway happens once to make pyruvate. The reduced NAD goes into the lactate fermentation pathway and so does the pyruvate. They work together and they form lactate and in doing this they make oxidized NAD again which can go back here and accept more hydrogens from the triose phosphate and then of course more ATP can be made. So if you ever get confused try and think of the purpose. The reason we're doing glycolysis is to make ATP but of course we can't keep doing this if we turn every NAD to a reduced form. Get the reduced form back to oxidized NAD by making pyruvate turn into lactate and then of course it can go back and feed again. So it can go round and round and round, making more ATP, and our muscles can keep contracting. And of course, the final goal is to make ATP production from glycolysis continue. Every time triose phosphate gets converted to pyruvate, four ATP molecules are made during the production of reduced NAD. And it's these ATP which we're trying to manufacture overall so that we can keep doing work. The problem with this reaction is the lactate molecule. It's an acidic molecule and it's also called lactic acid. So if it's not removed from the muscle tissue, it can lower the pH in the tissues and inhibit the actions of important enzymes. So here's the lactate molecule and it's acidic so it can donate hydrogens to the environment. So it brings the pH down in the muscle tissue and of course enzymes always have an optimum pH. If the pH drops too low, then it might stop working altogether. So this is quite dangerous. So we have to try and get rid of this lactate that we've made in trying to reoxidize our NAD. So the lactate produced is transported straight to the liver where it's converted back to pyruvate when more oxygen is available. So instead of keeping the lactate in the muscle where it can affect the pH, it's transported straight to the liver where it can build up. The liver is very good at dealing with toxic products. When oxygen becomes available again, it converts the lactate back to pyruvate via different reactions and of course the pyruvate can go on to glycolysis. Anaerobic respiration in plants and fungi takes a slightly different pathway to mammals but the overall purpose is still the same. So fungi and plants use the ethanol fermentation pathway, not the lactate fermentation pathway, in order to reoxidize their reduced NAD. In this pathway the pyruvate produced from glycolysis is decarboxylated and converted to ethanol. So here's our pyruvate made after glycolysis. And remember, plants and fungi still need to make ATP because it's the universal energy currency. So they still need to keep glycolysis going along. So pyruvate is converted to a molecule called ethanol. Don't get this confused with ethanol, it's ethanol. And in doing so, this process is decarboxylation. So you can see it's lost one of its carbons. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. So this enzyme here is pyruvate dehydrogenase. After this, the ethanol that we've made accepts the hydrogen atoms from the reduced NAD to make ethanol and oxidize NAD again. So here's our ethanol that we've just made. And of course, we've got reduced NAD that was made in glycolysis, carrying its hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom goes on to ethanol, and in doing so, the NAD is oxidized again, which of course is the main goal here so it can go back into glycolysis. The ethanol is converted to a molecule called ethanol, so don't get these two mixed up. And this reaction is catalyzed by ethanol dehydrogenase. So this here would be ethanol dehydrogenase. So again, we've remade the oxidized NAD, so it can go back to glycolysis. The oxidized NAD can go accept more hydrogen atoms from triose phosphate during glycolysis. So here's our diagram again, just to illustrate the point. In order for this step to keep going and making ATP for the plant and fungal cells to do work, we obviously will run out of oxidized NAD. So the reduced NAD comes along, takes part in the second step here where ethanol becomes ethanol, becomes reoxidized NAD again, and that feeds back in. So it can keep going round and round and round, and this step can carry on going forward. Remember, there is the step of pyruvate becoming ethanol, first of all. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.